At the previous video we discovered the processes occurring inside of a semiconductor diode with the help of a simulation software. After an update of the Java program, it is now used to demonstrate the processes inside of a bipolar junction transistor, which is treated at this video. Those device consists of a sandwich of variably doped semiconductor materials. At this animation there is an N-doped layer at the left side, the P-doped layer at the middle and once again an N-doped layer at the right side of the crystal. The total dimensions of the transistor are 100 to 122 atoms, which conforms to approximately 89 to 47 nanometers. The width of the two N-doped layers is 40 atoms, which is approximately 36 nanometers and those of the P-doped layer is 20 atoms, which is approximately 17 nanometers. Like at the simulation of the diode, the concentration of impurity atoms is significantly higher than inside of a real device. Remember, there is just one impurity atom between 10,000 and 10 million silicon atoms. The resolution of a full HD monitor is 1920 to 1080, meaning there are approximately 2 million pixels, hence, even with a high doped material there would be just 200 needle point sized impurity atoms at the screen. A full view simulation using those parameters would not be very helpful. From there, the simulation uses 143 impurity atoms and round about 12,000 silicon atoms, hence, there are approximately 84 silicon atoms per impurity atom. There is the same concentration of impurity atoms in all three layers, which doesn't conform to real devices but keeps the simulation simple. The movement of the electrons respectively holes is calculated as explained at the previous video. Initially, the force acting on an electron or hole caused by the electrostatic fields of all other charged particles inside of the crystal is calculated. A random component is added to the sum of the electrostatic forces, simulating the thermal movement. The electron is moving to those nearby atom, which is closest to the angle of the resulting force. The movement of the holes is slowed down by inserting random breaks between two steps. The migration of the charged particles away from the impurity atoms is favored by reducing the attracting forces acting inside of a small radius around the particles. In contrast to the previous simulation, the attracting forces between holes and extra electrons are lowered inside of this area too. We will see some later at this video what this manipulation is good for. Furthermore, the electric field caused by the voltage source is not calculated by adding an additional force pointing from the positive to the negative terminal. Instead, the voltage source causes a disequilibrium of charges near the zone of the terminals. The zone around the negative terminal is kept negatively charged in summation by injecting electrons, those of the positive terminal is kept positively charged in summation by removing electrons. Hence, an electric field is established which acts on all charged particles inside of the crystal. Those simple postulations are sufficient to describe the base principles of a transistor. There is a pin at each layer of the device. The negative terminal of the DC voltage source is connected to the N-doped layer at the left side of the crystal and the middle and the right layer are connected to two independent positive terminals. 
The left area is called emitter, because electrons are emitted from those layer while the transistor is operating. The electrons emitted at the left side of the device are collected by the positive terminal at the right side, which is why this area is called collector. The middle layer is called base and it is used to control the flow of electrons through the device. Let's start the simulation without connecting the transistor to a voltage source. Caused by the fact that extra electrons and holes are interacting just weakly while they are close to each other, there is a lower rate of recombination processes at this simulation. The simulation is running in fast motion mode until an equilibrium is established and no more recombination processes occur. Let's stop the simulation and have a closer look at the number of charges inside of different zones of the crystal. The two p-doped zones of the middle layer are three times negatively charged. The two zones to the left and to the right of the p-doped layer are five respectively two times positively charged. The thereby generated electric field inhibits the migration of holes from the p-doped middle layer respectively of electrons into those layer. The swap of movable charges between the crystal layers has stopped. The situation is similar to those inside of a diode with a single p-n junction. The difference is that we can see two regions with a lower number of movable charges. Two depletion layers are created. Let's connect the transistor to a voltage source. Firstly, the negative terminal is connected to the emitter at the left side and the positive terminal to the collector at the right side. Additional electrons are injected at the left side until the zone near the negative terminal is multiple times negatively charged. Caused by the voltage source, the zone near the positive terminal is kept positively charged by removing electrons. The total charge of those zones generates an electric field which pulls electrons to the right and the positively charged holes to the left of the crystal. At some of the previous videos I already explained that holes are no positive charged particles moving freely around the crystal. The movement of holes is caused by the interchange of electrons between atoms. Caused by the electric field generated by the voltage source, the width of the left depletion layer is decreasing while the right one is increasing. Recombination processes occur at the left side of the crystal, by what the number of holes inside of the p-dope layer is reduced once again. After some time has passed by, there is no more exchange of charges between the layers and an equilibrium is established. Let's have a look at the total charge of the different zones. Caused by the electric field generated by the voltage source, the right depletion layer has grown strongly. There are no moving charges located at zone number 6 and 7. The size of the left depletion layer at this simulation is still hard to observe. Nevertheless, it is sufficient to inhibit the movement of electrons into the p-doped middle layer. The p-doped layer is 21 times negatively charged, which is stronger than before and still keeps electrons away from this zone. There is a significantly higher number of electrons at the left n-doped layer, however, 
no current is running through the device. At this simulation, the virtual transistor is constructed symmetrically, hence, the result is mirror inverted if the positions of the positive and the negative terminal are exchanged. In contrast to a diode, no current is running through a transistor even while the polarity is inverted. That doesn't mean that we have reached the end of this video, because I have already mentioned the third pin at the p-doped middle layer. How can a current across the transistor be induced with the help of this layer? You could observe some electrons drifting into the p-doped layer while the transistor was connected to the voltage source before the state of equilibrium was reached. The middle layer was less charged in summation during this time, hence the force caused by the electric field was lower, so that electrons could diffuse into this region. How deep must an electron drift respectively diffuse into the middle layer to be able to cross the barrier? Well, if we have a closer look at the charge distribution, we can see that the electron is pulled to the right of the crystal if it is placed slightly to the right of the middle axis. So we have to make sure that electrons can reach this point. We can lower the barrier by removing negative charges from the p-doped layer. By extracting electrons, additional holes are created at this zone. In summation, the negative charge of the layer gets reduced. That is done by another voltage source connected to the third pin at the p-doped layer. A positive potential in correlation to the emitter has to be created at the base pin to be able to remove electrons. So let's apply a positive voltage to the base of our virtual transistor and observe the movement of the charged particles. Caused by the voltage source, additional holes are created inside of the p-doped layer, by what the total charge becomes less negative. Because of the electric fields inside of the crystal, the holes don't reside at this region. The field between emitter and base pulls the electrons to the right, hence the holes are moving to the left side. The voltage connected to the base keeps the number of holes inside of the p-dope layer on a nearly constant level. Electrons are injected at the emitter and removed at the base. Recombination processes occur around the left p-n junction, by what electrons and holes vanish inside of the crystal. An electric current is running from the emitter to the base. This mechanism is similar to those inside of a forward biased diode. After a short span of time, we can see some electrons passing the p-dope layer and drifting to the collector. An electric current is running from the emitter to the collector across the transistor. By attaching a voltage to the base of the transistor, the emitter-collector line became conductive. Let's stop the simulation and count the charges once again. By looking at the p-doped layer, we can see that those two zones are just 11 times negatively charged in summation. The point from which the electrons are accelerated to the collector is in range. The barrier electrons have to cross, driven by the voltage between emitter and collector has been lowered. The thermal energy of the electrons is sufficient to diffuse through the p-doped layer. Besides the electric fields caused by the distribution of charges, there is another obstacle for the electrons on their way to the collector, namely the holes inside of the crystal. 
if an extra electron and a hole are located side by side, both movable charges vanish during a recombination process. The number of holes inside of the p-dope layer is kept nearly constant by the voltage attached to the base, thus the gaps between the holes are relatively small. Hence, there is a relatively high probability that an electron hits a hole on its way through the middle layer. Only a few electrons can move through all gaps between the holes and reach the endope layer at the right side of the crystal. There are two electric circuits. Electrons recombining inside of the crystal cause a current running from the emitter to the base and those who cross the pitot player cause a current running from the emitter to the collector. As you can see, the current running through the base is significantly higher than those running to the collector. In practice, those relation is inverse. The number of electrons running from the emitter through the transistor to the collector is significantly higher than those running from the emitter to the base. Why is the ratio resulting from our simulation different from those in practice? Well, the probability that an electron can cross the p-dope layer increases if the gaps between the holes increase too. To reduce the number of holes, the number of impurity atoms has to be reduced too. Hence, the concentration of impurity atoms has to be decreased. Like mentioned at the beginning of this video, those concentration is significantly higher than inside of real semiconductor devices. Without the trick of lowering the interaction between extra electrons and holes inside of a certain radius around those particles, not a single electron could pass the middle layer at this simulation. Besides the concentration of impurity atoms, the size of the middle layer is critical for the electric properties of a bipolar junction transistor. If those layer is too thin, electrons can move from the emitter to the collector as soon as a certain voltage level is reached, even without a base voltage attached to the device. If the middle layer becomes too thick, the electrons can't pass the device even if a base voltage is attached to the transistor. The size of the middle layer has to meet the specifications of the operational voltage. Besides using a NPN sandwich, transistors can also be manufactured in PNP order. PNP transistors work in the same way, but the base has to be charged negatively by injecting electrons to make the emitter collector line conductive. Electrons are removed at the emitter and they are injected at the collector, hence the current is running in the opposite direction. One difference between the movement of extra electrons and holes is the mobility of those charges. Holes are moving slower through the crystal than electrons do. Hence, the time the holes reside in the middle and doped layer is larger than those of electrons inside of the p-doped layer in an NPN transistor. The larger transit time causes a higher probability for the holes to recombine with an electron and vanish on its way through the barrier. Without altering the parameters of the software, the number of holes moving from the emitter to the collector is zero while simulating a PNP transistor. To facilitate the movement of at least some holes from the emitter to the collector, the size of the endo player has to be reduced. 
Many parameters have to be considered while manufacturing bipolar junction transistors. Many different types of transistors can be designed for a high number of different applications. In the following videos we will see some different types of transistors and what they can be used for. The source code of the simulation software is available at the project page. That's all about bipolar junction transistors for today. Thanks for watching and bye for now.